Hello and welcome to a slightly unusual series of podcasts of the ANF podcast. In September, I joined Fiona Wells from Patch, friend of the show Vicky McEwen, and strategic lead for Adoption England, Sarah Jahal, to speak at the Safeguarding and Adoption online conference. With over 500 tickets requested, we were overwhelmed with the interest in this subject that affects so many families. The speakers and questions all brought a perspective that needs to be listened to by all those responsible for supporting adoptive families. You can also find details in the show notes of the work that Fiona, Vicky and Sarah do. Um, hi everybody, this is Al Coat. He is superstar, social worker, adopter and Churchill Fellow, among many other hats. And um he has helped me with my journey with patch um with his raw honesty and um and he's a pain in my ass pardon the french um and it's over to him there you go thank you so much i really appreciate i mean i'll be honest um this is a difficult issue i think that uh reflecting on what what do you say to a community of people, you know, uh, you know, over 500 tickets sold, people accessing it across the morning, uh, recordings going out afterwards, slides available. It, even just that number of 500 people who were interested enough to kind of get work their way through the Eventbrite process, which is, you know, torturous at, at, the, at the best of times. It really made me think about the investment a lot of people have put into adoption. And adoption sits really interestingly within uk english culture uh it, it it's reflected in that in you know 100, 100 plus years of legislation um to find homes for children and we can look back and we can see all the malpractice and we can see stuff that um at the time seemed wholly appropriate but but then uh now without you know with the 2024 lens we look back and go well that, you know that's not appropriate you know the removal of children from their uh, mums uh adoption without consent forced adoption and worse some of the abuses but we're at a stage now and i i find myself and probably like a lot of people is that my, how i view adoption is hugely informed by my lived experience i've got six adopted children over a period of uh the 25 years uh when i first started the process my children first moved in and i want to kind of make it clear that i believe in adoption uh then there's a comma and then there's a very big but if that, sorry if that's bad english but and what is the but um the but is it's got to be for the right children and i think the reality is that for many children that we've if we think back to say 1968 when i think the high water mark of number of children adopted a year was 25000 give or take um that was hugely represented by children that had been removed at birth which is of itself trauma but doesn't reflect the experience of almost every child that is adopted now We've got, you know, Vicky laid out fantastically the the levels of adversity that are not just post-birth, they're pre-birth, but also they're generational. You know, what we understand about epigenetics and the impact of uh, adversity and trauma across generations. is So the question to me is, do we have a system that meets the needs of those children? Do we have a system that has wholly got its feet in a different time period? Thinking about that the the happy ever after narrative holds really strong culturally. You know, you I'm sure anyone who's an adoptive parent will have had people sort of look at you and go, well, you've had them six months, so why isn't everything okay now? And that there's then then the flip side to that, the dark side to that is that when we then when we find the courage to put our hands up and say, we're not doing very well, that we are struggling, that then people instantly push back against that 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 they push back against that and say, well, why? Because I've seen I've seen Annie, and it's all meant to work out okay. Um. So we've got fam- we find ourselves in this really peculiar spot, and you know, Sarah, Sarah's was interesting to see that we're we're working our way towards finding out how many what is the state of the nation. We we do have the adoption barometer. Um. I do believe adoption should continue i think it but it's got to be for the right children but it's also got to be for the right adoptive parents i think that's another 
area where have we tracked the changes that have happened in society in 1968 if you were infertile which was you know infertile married couple and you couldn't have a baby which again was sort of a conversation with the doctor it's not tr- not working keep trying um that your level of grief and loss is profound but it's got a very distinct end to it a lot of the families who come to adoption now have been through years and sometimes decades of infertility treatments and the ex- that experience has hugely impacted on them and their perception of what parenting is like what they're looking to from parenting so this is about safeguarding in adoption and i think that we need to understand the raw materials that we're working with and we need to have that that knowledge in depth across of the whole system that that not just you know i mean in terms of it was mentioned social worker education i think that social worker education social work qualifications are generic and they cover cradle to grave and they don't focus in on adoption that's just the reality is when we've got you know adoption is a relatively niche area you know we've got 70,000 60 70,000 children who are adopted at the moment um but the reality is there's um, 14 million children in the UK so we represent a really small community but when we know that the risks for children are high and Fiona mentioned this then why aren't we preparing for those challenges when we've got the you know the beyond the adoption order from Julie Selwyn 2014 which sort of kick-started the the current pro we're, we're at the tail end of that process of renewal in terms of um the change to regionalization the change to um the adoption support fund being introduced um but the adoption the, the adoption barometer in, that comes out every year consistently focuses in that up to two-thirds of parents adoptive parents are experiencing violence and aggression from their children and that remains a really complicated issue for many families and a, 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 an issue that defines lots of adoptive parents experiences lots of adopted children's experiences lots of siblings experiences and it's an issue that we we continue to struggle to get our arms around and try and work out and how do we respond i remember um as a young adopter sorry a younger adopter and with a young child a three-year-old saying to a post-adoption support worker when i walk in in the morning to get her out of bed she spits at me and then not having a very good answer they said well perhaps they're picking up on your anxiety and i remember having this sort of this epiphany thinking you don't get this that yeah of course i'm anxious but i'm pretty sure that that isn't it's not the fundamental cause of why my child is behaving a certain way and there was a lack of understanding of these complex interfamilial relationships that develop when children who have experienced trauma who are vulnerable their behavior manifests and they start to make the people around them vulnerable as well and it's incredibly complicated and the responses that we get from services when they do sort of step in is is not good i mean i'm sure everyone's got apocryphal stories of social workers minimizing behavior or seeing behavior through a different lens blame is huge issue it's been mentioned in the chat again and again and again and i think that's a really complicated issue i think as a parent um firstly i think as as parents of children with complicated behavior uh, our very sense of self is fundamentally undermined it you know we thought that we were going to be a certain type of parent and we discovered we're a different kind of parent and um, that we start to see ourselves differently i know i thought i was a capable functioning adult i thought i would be good at this only to discover that i'm not very good at this that i'm not managing i'm not coping so people's perception of themselves fundamentally changes but their perception of the child fundamentally changes going from a position of being hardwired to see children as vulnerable but also a lot of us grew up in homes where we did as we were told where our parents said jump and we said how high on the way up and we totally understood the authority and relationship but where our children are just that they are grit in the machine they are not going to play nicely they're not going to go along with that and so we then start to see the children differently and we feel incredibly 
ashamed by that, embarrassed, uh, isolated, totally unable to manage that behavior. And when children are little, we can, we can contain that behavior that we can, you know, I know that, you know, when we're, we're dealing with little children, the behavior, as much as it can be really, really difficult, that we can often contain it and we keep silent. What happens as children get older is then that becomes, we cannot contain it any longer. And then we go and seek help and we feel incredible levels of blame. There was an interesting conference earlier in the year in terms of children with disabilities and how families often felt blame for that. Um, and a lot of our children do have disabilities, but, you know, I, I speak, I work with a lot of mums, adoptive mums. And I mean, mums feel guilt full stop. That's just kind of default position for a lot of mums, but in our circumstances we feel guilt and we feel shame and services come in and i think the dynamic is really difficult as i I often reflect as a social worker you come into a home and you see a child's behavior here and then you sometimes look at parents and you see that the impact of a change in perception feeling out of control not being able to control a child means that we sometimes slip the impact of that causes trauma and trauma isn't just you know trauma is massively overused within popular society you know people couldn't find what they wanted at the shops so they're traumatized they use it it's flippant language but the truth is that lots of the families that in our circumstance they find themselves genuinely traumatized and that may be because of single incidents where behavior spilled out and you know blimey that you know we could all tell stories about incidents you know incidents in the park incidents in the house incidents in the car where we've genuinely felt physical threat for either our child's welfare, our welfare, other children's welfare, partners, but also living in with a constant level of tension. You know, Fiona mentioned walking on eggshells all the time. And that is the truth that living in a house where there's a threat of violence or a threat of dysregulation, and even if it's, you know, even if the violence is moderate and low level, to live with that for not just a day, but for 24 hours, day after day after day after day, and people have been talking about respite where th- there's no one who can take a child because you don't, A, you don't necessarily trust that that parent, that adult can look after that child, but also the, the repercussions in the home can be often catastrophic that you then, you know, children will go to people, and I've had this, where you, my children will be able to mask and bottle up their emotions and people will come back and go, well, they were as good as gold. All I did was I just gave them, I just told them exactly what to do and they did it. The implication being that you need to just do it like I'm doing. And then my they we wave them goodbye and we say, thank you for the weekend. And my children start biting the edges off tables. Um, so really complicated, familiar dy- dy- dynamics within the home and people feeling overwhelmed. But as a social worker walking into that, we there's a balancing act that you, know, that you think, well, this is a child's behavior, but... This is an adult's behavior, seeing adults who are struggling to regulate themselves, adults who are struggling with their mental health. And when we, what we know about the impact of living with complicated, challenging behavior is that it has a huge impact on people's physical and mental health. That people, you know, we talk about from that maybe from low mood to sort of chronic depression, fatigue, that people engage in maladaptive strategies and, um, Vicky mentioned maladaptive strategies, but what that can often look like is staying up too late. You know, that I can recall vividly that the only time when there was a genuine sense of peace in my house was when the children were asleep. When they were at school, I was waiting for the phone to ring. When they were with someone else, I was waiting, I was hanging on the phone. When I wasn't in the house, I was waiting, you know, for, for my wife to ring. But when they were asleep, there was a few hours of peace. And the consequence of that is that then I would start to stay up later that I would kind of, that maximize that, um, that I would maximize that opportunity. Um, but then the that can look at lots of other, that can manifest in lots of other ways that actually maybe one, if you're in a partnership or a couple, or you know, a marriage, that one person is struggling to adapt. That you sometimes get these dynamics of the adopter and the one who went along with it. And that would have maybe man, not manifest if things had ticked along nicely, but actually you then get people who are really struggling to kind of say, actually, you wanted this. I don't think I ever did want this. And then all of a sudden people are fighting battles on two fronts. You've got children, but then you've got your partner. 
and people respond to stress in different ways. You've got people who maybe, you know, there's some fan, I read, I listened to some fantastic research and it was talking about uh, men's eating habits. And um, it talked about this phenomenon where middle-aged men will be sent on errands to the supermarket and then they will sit in the car park and eat cream buns and spend more time in car parks before going home. And I'm sure everyone's had that experience of thinking, I've got to go home and I don't know what I'm going to face. So I, I'll go the long way around or I'll park in a lay by and just try and regulate myself or sat on the drive thinking, do I have to go into the house? And all of this creates this really murky, you know, on, you can see that when you start to spell this out in terms of parental behavior, it looks like a problem. You know, if you were more engaged, if you were more present, if you got yourself to bed, if you didn't overeat or overdrink, or if you didn't X, Y, Z, if you were able to not shout and scream, if you were able to regulate, or if you would just put in some clear boundaries, then this wouldn't be the case. And so often professionals, it, I think it, in that context, it's wholly understandable. The professionals swerve towards the parents and go, you need to change. You need to be better. You need to put in more boundaries or less boundaries. You need to put in, and whatever the perceived issue is, you need to do it. And so parents come away going, I came to you for help with my child and you've come and you've told me I'm not doing a good job. I knew that. That's why I came to you. And, and that can be overwhelming as a parent. And um, again and again and again, you know, someone said in the chat, I, I feel heard, I feel seen. And I think that's the benefit of peer support is that people can sit with kindred spirits and go, I sometimes have dark thoughts. I sometimes get really angry. I sometimes lose lose my temper. Really, really, really tricky to to then manage that. And as professionals coming in, really complicated. I am. This is a window into my uh, my spare time. I look. I downloaded half a dozen statements of purposes from regional adoption agencies, and I looked up adult safeguarding. To, I, I kind of searched through to see if I could find anything about adult safeguarding. The difficulty is that the, the, the our children often make the adults in the house incredibly vulnerable and the, and yet the children themselves remain vulnerable and that is two things in tension we've got a system that is very much hardwired to focus in on protecting children and of course we have and of course we do want that and we've got a system where children and family social work is kind of focused on helping parents be better parents but sometimes that can perhaps un not see or overlook behavior of children or underlying issues for children. And oftentimes our children are incredibly vulnerable. My, my children, I think about their lives and I am overwhelmed with how they're doing so well. In spite of all of the stuff, blimey, would I walk a mile in their shoes? No, I wouldn't because their lives have been absolutely shocking. Um, so we've got this incredibly complicated soup of trauma and pain and with professionals walking in and not knowing where to start and also children my children having really um complicated interactions with social care um and my children's with different levels of self-awareness so a child being my, my child being incredibly art children all being incredibly articulate which dumbfounds me saying yeah but they're vulnerable and they go well i had a really reasonable chat with them and what they're saying is if you would give them a bit more flexibility. If you let them get the bus to town, if you let them have more pocket money, if you let them have more time on the phone, all of these really complicated, you know, we're, we're children with developmental trauma where they've got delay in, in terms of intellectually at this level, but socially and emotionally at this level. So wanting all the freedoms of their peers, but not necessarily having the, the emotional and social skills to actually remain safe in those. So parents holding, parents spinning dozens and dozens of plates and then a social worker coming in so i am um, i could keep going getting me to talk isn't the trick getting me to show up it is getting me is the trick i've got a few more things i really want to build kind of think about i think that we need to think about how we develop effective partnerships between families and and post adoption support services and children and families teams i'll give you an example um, from my own experiences that i I mentioned it, sort of, and I often say it flippantly, is that in 2008, I realised that I needed 
I needed to get a system knowledge that was going to get us through. And we've had some, you know, we've had some difficult days. Um, but that's my children's story and that's their business. So I'm not going to share. Um, but in 2008, I then qualified in 2013. And what I realized was that I don't necessarily need ongoing support. We had sort of access, we, we eventually got access to the adoption support fund through, but, but beyond that, what I actually needed was I needed a low level professional presence in my life on an ongoing basis. And in some ways, someone to bear witness to the story, someone to legitimize the narrative that we had. And I think one of the challenges we have, we have a, almost like a McDonaldization of services in the sense that we come, we get what we need and we leave. And I think that for families like ours, that the reality is that we, which flies against the culture of adoption because the culture of adoption says, here are your children, get on with your life. And if you need us, you know where we are. But I think the truth is that a lot of families, a lot of us need ongoing low level service. And so I had a fantastic social worker who was with Northumberland County Council and then moved to Adoption Northeast. So that's me naming where I'm from. Um, and I will name her if you want me to, but she was absolutely fantastic. And I had this really interesting conversation where I said, I'm not sure I need, I don't need anything from you, but I've, I'll take whatever you can give me. But what I do need, the thing I do need is that, will you keep my story safe? Because actually uh, when my children were little and then middle childhood and, and sort of adolescence, burgeoning adolescence, then full on adolescence and young people. Can I keep this story? Can you keep this story? Because actually the event that's going to, going to tip me into child protection or children of family services is not, that is not the event. It's the five years before where I kept it safe. I kept us safe. We kept us safe. It's this one event if it is taken in isolation, will be horrifying and it will provoke a response that is not, that misses out this, this, this huge tale that leads on. And so I was really lucky. And again, I was system literate. I was a social worker, but I said, I don't want you to do anything. And she got agreement from a manager, God bless her, to kind of keep me open on her caseload. But the promise was that I would never take up too much of a time and I would never be too involving every week, 10 days, or maybe sometimes it'd go for a couple of months, but I would send an email just so you know, we had this thing happened. We had an event, we had it and families will know those kind of where the, it, we, we bobbed along kind of difficultly, but we did, but then there'd be a, an event, an explosion or a, something would happen and I would email her and keep her in touch. And I'm not saying this to kind of brag or to kind of, you know, I can give you a name afterwards if you want. She, you can go and seek her out and she'll do it for you. I'm sure. Um, for money. Um, but what um, the, the point is that this collaborative approach and this open door approach meant that when this event happened and it did happen and we reached a point where we sort of reached a, an impasse and where my health, my wife's health, the children's health was at risk, mental health, physical health, that I could then call on someone. I could say, this isn't, don't believe, you don't have to believe me, but can I bring in this person? who can bear witness for me. Can I, and we need to be in a place where we have services that wrap around our families. Cause the truth is that we live in a, a multi textured world where school need to know what's going on in our lives. Um, w f several years earlier, we'd contacted the police and helped them understand the context of our family, because it wasn't a case of if we'll call you, it'd be a case of when we call you and when we call you, we want you to do, this and this is how we want you to help and they were fantastic i rec strongly recommend calling police on the day when you're not unraveling we had education school who we'd worked with and again I i'm not saying this because i'm an amazing person it's just i kind of saw the writing on the wall 10 years earlier and i'd become a social worker and i know that that legitimized my voice and i also understood how systems work and a lot of families don't you know, a lot of people, the minute the door, the minute services arrive is when this incident occurs and services are, are reactive and they sort of, they d sort of fail to understand this, this context. So I'm not pretending that that was easy and I'm not pretending that everything worked out tickety boo. I've got my story and it's complicated and it will remain complicated. Vulnerable children become vulnerable adults. Um, what do I believe? I believe in adoption. 
I believe, you know, I'm, you know, someone's talking about false allegations. I spent 11 days removed from my house by the police at one point. And that wasn't this incident. <laughs> this was this incident. Um, interestingly, the police, the best social work I've ever had was off a police officer who said, Mr. Coates, what are you going to do to keep yourself and your family safe? Uh, the police said I could go home, but social care said I couldn't. Complicated. And that, my story's not exceptional. My story's just one of 600, 700,000, you know, hundreds every year. So I guess my call really is to, is that we need to understand safeguarding within the context of what are we dealing with? What is the raw materials? Um, we need a system that's collaborative. I was going to kind of, I thought I'd be a smart aleck um, in terms of, and was going to unpick the CARE Act in terms of what is safeguarding. But safeguarding is that. It's contextual. It understands the family that it's working with. It works in partnership. And as much as I'm a social worker, having a social worker knock on your door and not asking it to come in, you know, saying I am coming in have, and a police officer stood on the shoulder is a terrifying experience for any parent. And, a, and as has been mentioned, a traumatizing experience that leaves a, casts a shadow across all of the members of the household. Um, so I don't have a pithy end point for that, but I just, I, I want to encourage people to say that, um, that change, change will come. Uh, that we're a community of people who've got voices. We're a community of people who, you know, the, the amount of professionals I meet that are adoptive parents who understand that we we may not see it this year, and for some of us it's too late, but we will see change. Um, we've got people like Fiona and all the people who've joined today. We've got people like Sarah. Um, we need data. We need conversations. And this feels like a... This feels like a start line, and uh, I'm massively encouraged uh, that Fiona's had the inspiration to do this. So we'll not turn it into a love-in. Um, is there any questions that I need to answer? Anything not you want loads, to ask? Because I, I, I've left it to you. No, I haven't. Right. Yeah. I'm not as good at multitasking. I, I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how to look at two screens and concentrate at the same time. No, I can't feel my legs when I do it. So you know, my body has to yeah. shut down in part. Um, that was me. That so, was you. Um, I, that, I think um, I would have given you a round of applause at one point, but I couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, <laughs> I, I absolutely think uh, there's so many people commenting on on how much they could relate and how glad you'd said things out loud and and how helpful it was to hear you share your views on that um, so brilliantly. So thanks, Al. Thank you. <laughs>